sound is one of the most important parts of any video game, whether it's a simple sound to say that you've collected something, or a bigger signal that you need to respond urgently. The most important use of sound in games, though, is atmosphere. And while modern games have a whole variety of sound effects tools at their fingertips, there is one thing that has been with video games basically since their inception. Music. If you grew up with gaming like I did, then you'll probably find that that music is kept in a safe little file in your mind, comfortable and ready to be pulled at any time regardless of how good it sounds. One of the first things I ever played was a ZX Spectrum game called Jet Set Willy. Once you've got over how ridiculous that title is, it's actually a very fun and ridiculously challenging game. It set a precedent for modern games like Celeste or Super Meat Boy by having your character go and collect items in an incredibly lethal environment. And the whole time you were doing this, you were soundtracked by eight bars of Edvard Grieg's In the Hall of the Mountain King, reproduced in the best way that the Spectrum sound chip could handle. Later releases of the game would feature If I Were a Rich Man as a play on the story of a wealthy playboy trying to clean up his mansion after a party. The Commodore 64 version featured Buck's Inventions Number no. 1, and the one thing that was consistent between all of these was Moonlight Sonata as the opening menu music. Haunting. They knew what they were doing back in 1984. It's crazy to think that the very next year we got this. Super Mario Bros. was released for the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1985 and changed the face and sound of home console gaming. And it's all thanks to one man, Koji Kondo. Kondo was the first sound designer that Nintendo hired who specialised in composition. And while he worked on some games prior, it was the themes of Super Mario Bros. in 85 and The Legend of Zelda in 86 that established him as a hero in the video game music community. He still works at Nintendo, and he's worked on almost every single Mario and Zelda game since, right up to Mario Tennis Aces this year. But that first theme is what endeared him to more than one generation of gamers. Even a cursory search for Mario Brothers cover turns up people playing this iconic theme on everything from electric guitar to violin to a Chinese miniature organ called a Sheng. This is music which has transcended the form of video games to become culture in and of itself. Of course, it wasn't going to be long before Nintendo had a challenger, and in 1991, Sega and Masato Nakamura fired a shot across their bow. And this time, in a whole 16 bits. I'll be honest, Sonic the Hedgehog is the whole reason that I'm a musician. The music of those Genesis, or Mega Drive in the UK, Sonic games, blew my tiny mind as a child and there is not a single zone from Sonic 1 through to Sonic & Knuckles that I couldn't sing to you. But don't worry, I'm not going to. Masato Nakamura was the composer for Sonic the Hedgehog 1 and 2 whilst also writing and recording albums with his band Dreams Come True. It's notable that the song Sweet 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 from their album The Swinging Star shares a melody with the ending theme from Sonic 2 but really any of the music from that game could be a hit. Chemical Plant Zone alone absolutely slaps. Some of the very best music in the Sonic series, however, is in Sonic the Hedgehog 3. And we'll look at the mysterious reasons behind that in the next video. Thanks for joining me. If you like this, please leave a comment, like and subscribe. Let me know what your favourite piece of video game music is, or that one that you just cannot get out of your head. I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you that if you press the orb here, then you uh, you can subscribe to our channel. Alternatively, you can look at the uh, the videos 
over here to enjoy the other stuff that we do. See you soon.